One of the things that most of us have trouble with is wanting things for other people that are simply not within our power to give them. I know I do that on a regular basis. And I'm guessing that some of you do that also. There are things you want for other people. And what I want for you this morning, not so much, I'm almost afraid to say this, not so much to listen to the sermon, but to get a hold of the peace and the joy and the love that Jesus has to give for you. And that part of the way that he does that is by our coming together to encourage, to strengthen, to love, to support one another. And that's one of the things I would like for you to go home with. Would I like for you to listen to the sermon? Of course. But I think these things may be even a little greater, and I hope in some way the lesson this morning can add to those things. The latest report on Jeannie is she did have a squamous cell cancer removed from up here. Uh, they had to do two uh, takes in order to get the borders clear. She did tell me that there is now a test that is available, a genetic test, that they will give her a genetic test and if her genetics lean toward susceptibility to this cancer, squamous cell, then she will have to have radiation. If her genetic test leans away from that tendency, then she won't. Science is amazing, but it doesn't hold a candle to God. Amen, Amen to that. One of the things that Peter wanted his readers to know in 2 Peter, his last epistle that we have, shortly written before his death. Know this, first of all, now if I were to put that in my words, I would say, I want you to get this, you hear? <laughs> know this, first of all, no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever made by the act of of human will. Do you know what that means? Creeds written by men are not scripture, nor are they to be treated as scripture. Amen. That's not in my notes, but it's still the truth anyway. But men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. And of course, the setting for this series of character qualities that Peter insists that we need to have are prefaced by verses 3 and 4 and they tell us that God has given us all we need for life and godliness that God has given us all we need for, for I'm one ahead of myself that he's given us magnificent and precious promises that through him we can become partakers of the divine nature and by his will we can escape the corruption that is in the world. And then in verses 5 through 7, he says, I want you to give all diligence. In other words, in view of what God has done for you, I want you, my readers, to give all diligence to add to your faith moral excellence and to moral excellence knowledge and then now he throws in another word and that word is self-control the King James Version uses the word temperance because back in 1614 whenever the King James Version was being put out the word temperance did not mean abstinence from alcohol because the temperance movement in the early 19th century has kind of changed the meaning of that word. But the word actually, the word literally means, if I were to give you the Greek words, they wouldn't make any sense, but the Greek words literally translated means in strength, inward strength. And that's why the word self 
that's the end part. Control is an awesome translation of that word. Strength in ourselves. Self-control. One definition given to it, it is the virtue of one who masters his own desires and passions, especially his sensual appetite. Who's the boss around here? We can say to the person in the mirror, and if we are able to say Jesus and mean it and it's true, then that's because we are practicing self-control and bringing our own will and our own wishes in harmony with His. The noun self-control is only used four times in the New Testament. The adjective is used only once, and it's in reference to a qualification of an elder. An elder is to have self-control. And then the verb is only used twice, once in a positive way and once in a negative way. But the interesting thing about the use of the word self-control is the fact that sometimes it's sandwiched between other words. And so when we start looking at these other words in view of self-control, we begin to see that self-control is necessary in order for these other words to work. I'll show you what I'm talking about in just a moment. The nouns are used once in Acts 24, verse 24 and 25, once in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit, and then twice in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 6. Let's begin with Acts chapter 24, verses 24 and 25. Now the context is, Paul has been arrested in Jerusalem. There was a plot by 40 men that they would neither eat nor drink until they had killed the Apostle Paul. Paul's nephew finds out about this plot, tells the centurion who's in charge, or gets that message to him, and so they flee to the seashore of Caesarea. So now Paul is in prison at Caesarea, and the governor who is there is named Felix. His wife is Drusilla. Paul has already gone before Felix and has been accused by Tertullian, a lawyer for the Jews who had come from Jerusalem. Confused by now? <laughs> I'm getting to the verse we're talking about. And so now, Paul has already heard the accusations made against him by the Jews who had come from Jerusalem to Caesarea. He's back in prison. And now it turns out that Felix's wife is Jewish. And so Felix and his wife come to Paul to hear him about his faith. And that's where we begin. Some days later, Felix arrived with Drusilla, his wife, who was a Jewish, and sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. So Paul wasn't defending himself here. He was trying to share the gospel of Christ with Felix and Drusilla. But as he, Paul, was discussing, here it is, righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix became frightened. Do you have any idea as to why? Because Felix was not living God's way. His wife knew of God's way. She was Jewish. And when Paul talked about the fact that you, Felix, need to live righteously, you're going to have to practice self-control in order to live righteously. You're not going to be able to live the way you have been living. You're not going to be able to do some of the things you've been doing. You're going to have to have self-control. And Felix, if you don't, you're going to be judged by God. No wonder Felix was frightened. But that's the context in which we have that word self-control. Do you see how important it is in that context? If you're going to be righteous, you're going to have to have self-control. Period. It isn't going to be put on you. God's not going to take some force and make you be 
righteous and live a holy life. You have to do that yourself. Present your body as a living sacrifice, Paul says in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. Do you see how self-control relates to the judgment to come? If you're not ready for the judgment to come, if you haven't controlled yourself in harmony with the will of God, if you haven't done what God seeks you to do, if you haven't walked in the light, then Felix, when the judgment comes, you and Drusilla are doomed. Self-control is an absolute necessity in Christian living as pointed out in Acts chapter 24 and 25. How does it relate to righteousness? Look at Romans 6 verses 12 through 13 and in particular this phrase. Present your members as instruments of righteousness to God. What does that mean? I'll put it in my terms. God, here I am. What do you want me to do? And God says, read the book and you'll find out. I know what a lot of people like to do is say, God, here I am. What do you want me to do? I'm waiting to hear directly from you. No, get in the Word. Get in the book. Get in the book. Let's look at another verse about that. All Scripture. Huh. Isn't that interesting? All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for instruction, for correction, and for what? Training in righteousness. You want to be righteous? Get in the book. Train yourself in what you find in the book. Don't sit around waiting for some inspiration separate or apart from the Word of God to say, here's what God wants you to do. Get in the book. Because the Bible makes the claim that you can be trained in righteousness and be thoroughly equipped, that's part of this same passage, by knowing the Word of God. But if you don't have enough self-control, you won't even read it on a regular basis. That Bible will sit on the shelf. It will sit on the coffee table. It will sit in the pocket in your car. It will sit somewhere in a book rack and never be opened day after day after day because you don't have enough self-control to get in the book. Am I making sense? Is that Bible? Am I talking Bible to you or am I talking Bill Keel stuff? I'm convinced I'm talking Bible. The Scripture is what equips us to train ourselves to be righteous. And friend, if you don't know the book, you're going to struggle with being righteous. What about relation to the coming judgment? I like Romans chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, but especially these parts, parts of it. To those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But to those who are selfishly ambitious, no self-control, and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation. And that's what Felix is hearing about. Now we don't hear all that Peter, all that Peter, uh, Peter told Felix. We only hear the summation of it. He talked a lot about righteousness. He talked a lot about self-control, and he talked a lot about to the, ju the judgment to come. To the point that Felix was frightened. But I'll tell you this. History tells us he was not frightened enough to change the way that he lived. He wasn't even frightened enough knowing Paul was innocent but kept him in prison hoping for a bribe to get him out. You know, that's one of the dangers about coming to church a couple of times. May, you may only learn enough to make yourself uncomfortable. And that's what some people do. 
they'll come and hear one or two, three lessons, and it makes them uncomfortable, and they don't want any more discomfort, so they don't go anymore. That's Felix. That's exactly what he did. Let's look at the second place it's used. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now, I only pick the word that's next to self-control, although self-control is involved in all these words. But I want to focus a little bit on the word that God chose to stand right next to self-control. Listen to Jesus. He uses that word gentle in Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle. Sometimes that word is translated as meek. I am gentle in heart and you will find rest for your souls. Well, this doesn't mean that there still won't be turmoil in other parts of our world. But when it comes to your soul and your relationship with God, He will give you peace and He will give you rest. And self-control is part of having a gentle spirit. Do you know anybody who flies off the handle, goes into a fit of rage at the moment? Have you ever been to a toy store and watched a two-year-old out of control? I mentioned to you before, I asked the clerk at Toys R Us on one occasion, I said, doesn't all this screaming get on your nerves? And she actually said, well, after a while, I don't even hear it. And I thought, you lucky lady, you lucky lady, because when I'm in a tour store and I hear it, well, I won't go into what I think. You can use your imagination. Look at James chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. In regard to gentleness, the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, Willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and hypocrisy. Don't you see the role that self-control plays in all of this? I know I'm focusing on gentleness and kindness. But it is a necessary part of all of this. Look in the mirror. Bill, are you in control of yourself? And I know the answer is not all the time, but Lord, help me grow in it. Help me be more in control of myself in accord to your will than I have been. And when I stumble and fall, help me to have the self-control to get up and take hold of your hand again and walk in the light with you. We need self-control. And finally, we go to 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 6. And I'm not going to spend much time here with the words that surround self-control. Because last week we talked about knowledge. Guess what we're going to talk about next week? Perseverance? You got it right. So I'm not going to spend a, a lot of time with these words, but I do want to ask you the question. In order for you to have the knowledge that God wants you to have, is it going to take self-discipline, self-control, inner strength, in strength, to get that knowledge. Right there between knowledge and, and perseverance is self-control. If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine and you will know the truth. And the truth will make you free. What is the truth? Do you know what the Bible says truth is? I'll leave you hanging on that one. Go look it up. 1 John 5 and verse 13. Here's something else 
that you need to know, but you'll only know this if you practice self-discipline and self-control. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. If I am living an undisciplined life, this is something I cannot know. I can hope it. I've even talked to Christians from time to time and asked the question, are you going to heaven? If you think you know the most common answer, raise your hand and then I'll give it to you. Do you think you know what it is? I hope I am. I hope I am. We need to know this verse. But there's only one way to know it. And that's to practice the qualities that Peter talks about in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. Let's look at the relation of self-control and perseverance. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. If I don't have self-control, I'm not going to put on the full armor of God. I'm going to put on just enough to hope I don't get killed by Satan. Just enough to say that I'm a Christian. I'm not going to put on the whole battle because, folks, I don't plan on going to war. I plan on going sitting in the pew, but I don't plan on going to war for Christ. War means I'm on the aggressive for the Lord. I'm seeking the lost to save them. I'm studying His Word. I am a soldier in the army of the Lord and that will not happen without self-control. Because you see, the Lord doesn't draft anybody into His army. It's a total volunteer army in their by choice, totally by choice. James chapter 5 and verse 11 says, Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. That's self-control. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. You want His compassion and mercy? then keep on keeping on. Practice self-control. The devil will throw excuse after excuse after excuse if we're willing to listen. I have no idea how many times I've told this illustration, but it still makes the point. A neighbor came over to borrow the lawnmower from, the, uh, from another neighbor. And he knocks on his door and he said, I'd like to borrow your lawnmower. And the neighbor said, I'm sorry, I, I, I can't let you mow it because I'm taking a nap. And the neighbor says, what does taking a nap have to do with loaning me the mower? He said, well, if I don't want to loan you the mower, one excuse is as good as another. Do you get the point about serving the Lord? If you don't want to serve the Lord, one excuse is as good as another. For none of them are any good. Let's look at the verbs and how they're used in self-control. Doesn't this passage make sense about self-control? Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath but we an imperishable. There it is, book, chapter, and verse. We're not going to get the goal without self-control. Kind of rhymes, doesn't it? But it's worth putting in your memory. 
We're not going to get the goal unless we practice self-control in the will of God. Let's look at the second verb where it's used, and it's used with the word not. But I say to the unmarried and widows that it is good for them to remain even as I, but if they do not have self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Boy, our world needs this. How many people are living together unmarried that this verse applies specifically to that situation? I say to my son, Son, I know you're in love with this girl. Are you behaving? Do you need to get married? That's what this verse is saying. We need to exercise self-control, but I'll tell you this. You still have to practice self-control after you're married. <laughs> you still have to practice self-control in the way that you love your husband or the way that you love your wife or the way you love your children. Some of you have probably used the expression I'd like to strangle him, but you didn't. Or her, as the case may be. Self-control. Here's how Paul put it in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. We don't do this self-control all by ourselves. We find strength in studying the Word of God. We pray to God for strength. We lean upon one another for strength. I think my next article for the local paper and the Facebook article is going to be entitled Virtual Christianity. We have so many people today who are practicing virtual Christianity. They're staying home watching the sermon on television. They're not encouraging anybody. They're not being encouraged by anybody. They're not supporting anybody. They're not involved in doing anything with the local congregation. They're practicing virtual Christianity and thinking that that's all right. What does the word virtual mean anyway? Exactly the same as? No. Something like virtual Christianity. COVID has been blamed on virtual Christianity in the lives of many people. But folks, COVID has nothing to do with a Christian deciding to stay home and watch it on TV and not encourage brothers and sisters in the congregation, not be an active participant in the songs that are sung with brothers and sisters present, never shaking anybody's hands, never patting anybody on the back, never looking someone in the eye and saying, I've been praying for you. First, uh, that's for another time, isn't it? 2 Timothy 1 and verse 12. For this reason I suffer these things, but I'm not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and am convinced that he is able to guard what I've entrusted to him until that day. I want to tell you what I think an unexpected blessing of self-control is. I think it's joy. I think there is a true joy that a person can know when they have chosen to do what is right when their flesh would have had them to do otherwise. They chose to put themselves to bed early Saturday night so they could be alert on Sunday morning. 
they have chosen to say hello to somebody and ask how they're doing when they really would be rather watching the Texas OU game. They have chosen to go visit somebody in the hospital knowing that they're apprehensive in doing so. And realizing I have done good. And I'm happy with myself because I chose to do what was right when I know there was a part of me that didn't feel like it. That's not hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is pretending you did the right when you didn't. Or doing it for the wrong reason. For the praise of men. But you have the right to feel good about yourself. And to rejoice in the fact that you're winning the battle for Jesus Christ. In your own personal life. What's the end result of faithful self-discipline, self-control in walking in the light, holding the hand of the Lord, stumbling and falling but getting up and holding on His hand again? I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. It takes a lot of self-control to be willing to obey the gospel of Christ sincerely. You see, a lot of people think getting baptized is what it's all about. No. What it's all about is dying to yourself so that baptism has some meaning because if I haven't died to myself, baptism doesn't mean anything. You don't bury people who are still alive to themselves. You bury people in baptism with Christ who have died to themselves and be raised to walk in newness of life with Jesus Christ. And in that is the joy and the peace and the love and the hope that you are reminded of when you come to worship together with our church family. Because that's what we are. We are blood brothers and sisters made so by the blood of Christ. An eternal blood that will keep us through eternity. Not the blood of my father and mother, but the blood of my Savior. Are you in Christ, holding His hand, walking faithfully, exercising the kind of self-control that helps keep you walking in the light? And my friend, my brother, my sister, God bless. You have every reason to know real joy in Christ.